half a warm welcome to this online edition of Doric Call My Bluff. My name is Peter Reid and I'm a professor at Robert Gordon Varsity in the Toon and I've I have a recht interest in our Doric tongue. Doric Call My Bluff is part of the Across the Grain Festival 2020 that is brought to you by Live Life Eberdinshire. Last year we had the finals out by at Arden Country Park, but this year we're doing it online for the first time. And mine knew and play at home. But first let's say a muckle aye aye to our panellists, for our aar folk for Aberdeenshire libraries. Susan is early years librarian. Hello. Gary is media producer. Fit like. And Irene is library assistant. Hello. So, let's get yoked and take a kick at our first word. Fit is Cadis. Cadis. So, Susan, can we hear your definition of Cadis, please? A Cadis. It is the name files gain to orphan lambs. So the yo might have died giving birth to the lamb, or maybe she's had multiple births and wasn't able to feed them all, or maybe she's rejected a lamb. But only why this little lamb, the caddis, in order for it to survive, somebody would have had to a hand rear it. Often this would have found to the farmer's wife or some of the family and the lamy would have had to be teen inside and maybe put in the rebarn oven or at the front of the fire to keep it warm and then of course run o'clock care we bottle feeding and out for the lamy. So the caddis would have been an orphan lamb. A new Irene please. Now this word Cadis. Cadis is a bit of jewellery that you might have bought for your loved one. If you was going to be proposing to your loved one, you wanted to buy her a piece of jewellery, but you just couldn't afford to buy a fancy ring, you might buy a Cadis piece of jewellery. Now, Cadis was crushed beetle shells. Iridescent, of a bony colours, would sort of change as you moved with a different light it would change colour so it was really bony and it did look expensive but and it did look like you'd worked hard and saved hard to buy your loved one a fancy ring but the true fact was and you'd I hope that it wouldn't hit to get it valued because then they would really care the true worth but um, if you couldn't afford a fancy ring this was the one for you a Cadiz piece of jewellery and uh, it looked more expensive than it really was. So, but a caddis was a jewellery made out of crushed beetle shells. And finally, Gary, your definition of caddis. You might find only a number of things beneath your bed. There might be monsters. There might be a biscuit tin full of cellar. There might be a chunty for thin your coat short during the night but more than likely they'll be cuddis. Now, you might ken them as dust bunnies. In Hungary, they're called dust kittens. And in Germany, they're called wool mice. Cuddis is just those balls of fluff that gather in hard-to-reach places, and especially beneath your bed. So there we have it, three different definitions of cuddis. Fitna end, if you think, is right. Is it... A. An orphan lamy. B. A bit of costume jewellery. Or C. A kind of fluff or oo. Would our panellists reveal the right answer? I, Gary, had the right answer. Cadis is a kind of fluff or oo. Fit Mrs. Beaton Cad in her book The Baka Benehi, 
the refuse occludes. So now we move on to our second word, that is in timers, in timers. And our first definition this time comes from Gary. When you begin a house, you need all kinds of bits of wood. You need geese for the fleer, posts and dwangs for the wars, and trusses and sarkin for the reef. Now all these bits of wood together are called the intimers. That's the timmer you use to big your house. Now long ago the carpenter would have been responsible for the intimers, all the rock kind of stuff, and the joiner would have done the fancier stuff, the doors, windows and staircases. And on a ferrum, the old man, he would have looked after if it was called the park timmers, the fences, gates and the panes. But the end timbers, they were the wood that was used to build your house. And now, Irene, would you give us your definition of oh, end timbers, please? Now, as word end timbers, on a Sunday, a foreign minister starts his service to Kirk, um, he would read out some announcements. Now, this could be to tell the elders for the next Kirk session meeting us, or it could be to tell the congregation how much money was raised at the bring and buy sale, or maybe just to, for folk to note some things in their diary that maybe was going to be happening in the community or the next week or month. Nowadays, um, being a bit more modern, the folk would maybe call them the intimations. But in days gone by, they would have been called the intimers. So intimers is the announcements made by the minister to the congregation before I start the service to let them ken if it's gone on in the community and in the kirk. And lastly, Susan, please. Your intimers is your inside, or the inside workings as something. So, for example, our intimers are made up of a large intestine and a small intestine. This is for digestive system that helps process our food. So, you can in diagrams and books, that's your sausage-shaped stuff that marks up your large intestine and your small intestine. For all your mates broken down, be enzymes. Well, you've got to eat plenty of fruit and vegetables, plenty of fibre, so that all this work ends go on properly. Because if you dinner, well, that's when you feel off a fall up, or bloated, or maybe even constipated. Now, you dinner want to be constipated, or else you'll hate to talk the dreaded syrup of eggs or something similar to get on moving again. I mind fine. When I was a young lassie, getting the syrup of eggs, well, whether you was needing to know. <laughs> so, your intimers is your inside workings of your body. So there we have it. Three definitions of intimers. Fit the end, if you think, is right. Is intimers A, the word used to pick a hoose? the bands or intimations for the pulpit in the kirk, or C, the inner workings of anything, including your intestines. Would our panellists reveal the right answer? And Susan has the right definition. The inner workings are anything, including your intestines. And there's nothing more than racks in your intimers. So now it's time for our third word. Fit is rowpy. Rowpy. So firstly to Irene. Now let me tell you the right definition of rowpy. One of my most memorable holidays was fun. My hubby and I took our coins down to the Lake District. We were lucky, we'd, it was a fine, fine week with bonny weather and this one day we would hear a walk round the edge of Coniston Waters. Beautiful day as I say, 
Quines were having a ball, skimming stains with our dad, just enjoying the outdoor life and, and, and just it was just fantastic to watch them. Now, it was made even better when they came across a rupee. And somebody, it may have been camping or somebody finds nearby, had made a handmade swing by using a big thick rope tied round a branch of a tree, tied securely and made us into a handmade swing. Now, my memory is not that good, so I can't mind if it was a tyre or a, a seat it was on it for him to use as a swing. But anyway, whatever it was, I mind they had such a great time. Swinging back and forth, tacking turns, it was just a joy to watch them. And it was just such a happy memory for me, because it was just one of these unexpected days and it was just lovely. I have a happy memory. Uh, so a rupee is a handmade swing tied, made with a thick rope, tied round a branch of a tree, a rupee. A nougare, please. If you're ever in Dundee and you take a walk round the outside of the McManus Art Gallery, you'll come up on a statue at Oor Wally. And in his hand, he's holding a pea shooter. Now some say that he's painting this at the back of the heed of Robbie Burns, whose statue is near that far away. But if you were a young loon with a pea shooter, dried peas might be hard to come by. Your mother maybe was not happy about you just helping yourself out of the cupboard. And so you had to improvise. Fortunately, in the late summer and the early autumn, there was I in abundance of rowan berries, and they were just the right size. Burns were I tell that these bricked reed berries were poisonous, and right enough they would fairly gi a sair belly if you ate them raw. So, when you're using them in your pea shooter, you had to mine and blah and nae sook, just in case you swallow it in by mistake. So the Burns started to call these rowan peas, and in the way that language changes over time, this becomes shortened to row peas. So a row pea was just a rowan berry, then it was used in a pea shooter. And finally, Susan, could you give us your definition? A row pea. Now there's a word, isn't it? Well, I think it's a grand description of how you actually feel. I'll give you a few instances of how you might feel a row pea. Can fit like when you're coming down with a call, you've got a sick in a throat and you're feeling a bit of worse kind. You try to speak, but well, <laughs> it comes out either as a whisper or a screech. You just have a good control over if it's coming out. Or maybe you've been at a fit bar, cheering on your team and singing, but next day, well, you're feeling the effects out and you're a bit of worse kind. Or maybe, maybe it's the morning and after the night before and you've been taking the National Scottish drink for medicinal purposes, of course. But you've woken up the next day and you're feeling a bit ropey. Your throat's just a bit of hair skin. So ropey is when you've got a sick in a throat and you're a bit of hair skin. So there we are, three different definitions of raupi. Fitna in is it? Is it A, a handmade tree swing? B, a roddenberry used in a pea shooter? Or C, feeling a thochty horse? Would our panellists reveal the right answer? Susan has the right definition. Raupi is feeling a thought a horse. So now we move to our fourth word, and it's ran. Ran. So, Gary, could we hear your definition first, please? When I was a young loon, every week or maybe every fortnight, we used to get a visit for the fishman. Now, if I saw him and was walking home for the school bus, I used to think it was a bit of a mixed blessing. On the one hand, it meant that he might give my up the road in his van, but on the other hand, it meant we were probably getting something fishy for our tea. 
Now, that could be y'all are fish and eggs, which I wasn't a great fan of. It could even mean potted heed, because he also sell that out to his fan, and to this day the very thought of that marks my cowk. Or it could be ran. Now, ran was just fish roe. If the eggs had come for a sturgeon, wind would cut caviar. But this was the eggs were a cod, or possibly a heron, and so it was card ran. A new Irene. Now, this word ran is spelled R-A-A-N, and it's an adjective, a word to describe how your hands feel if you've been ploutering in cold water for hour long. Now, in the days, well, like for my granny wouldn't have had a washing machine, she'd have had to rinse her, her clothes in this cold, freezing cold water in a big deep sink, and it wouldn't have been awful fine for our hands because we've been raw and sere. And in the winter months, it got us bad. She would form chilblains on our hands. Now, I wasn't for believing her, but she assured me that to help a wee bit, you would rub mustard on your hands or have a hate mustard bath. And that would just take the itch to the chilblains and just give you a wee bit of relief um, for the sere feeling that you had on your hands. So... Thank goodness we are blessed with washing machines nowadays because I wouldn't have liked to put up with that. So, ran is that word to describe how your hands feel when they're sear with chilblains after ploutering and steeping your hands in cold water for hour long. And lastly, Susan, please. Now, we've all been ran. Near ran, well, We've all been wrong as well, of course, but I'm speaking about ran. Now, you can fit like when sun shining bright early in the morning and you think for a rare day, so you go out without your jacket. And that's all right. Fine day, bonny day, until you're ready to go home. And then the dark clothes have gathered and... Dawn comes the rain, heaven's open, and yes, you when a coat, absolutely soak at wheat long before you get home. And that means you're absolutely run, which means you're absolutely drenched, drooked, soak it to the skin. So, three different definitions are run. Fit in, is it? Is it A? fish row, B, fit hands are like after he had been in cal water, or C, off a drukit. Would our panellists reveal the right answer? And this time, Gary has the right definition. Ran means fish row, something I can find coming for the coast. So we come now to our fifth and final word, fit is fulpy, fulpy. So, Susan, could you kick off, please? A fulpy is better kent nowadays is a puppy. When I was a wee queen, my mum and dad used to breed West Highland Terriers, bony white fluffy doggies. Bony why I had lots of foppies to play with. There was a litter of puppies on the go. And all oh, fit fun we had. They were all lying there in the basket with them with that. And they got a bit of bigger and they were onto solid foods. Oh, me feet were in the plate along with the mate. And then they were up to mischief at all kinds. Chawing about your fingers, slippers, clays, or anything. They come on, they would chew. But then they would just look at you, can we on bony, big, dark eyes, and your hair would melt. You couldn't be annoyed with the little critters for long. No matter fit us out of the maid. So a fulpy is a puppy. A new Irene. Now, let me tell you what the right definition of fulpy is. When I was a young queen and would play in, and maybe in a call, call with her, when it was, I oh, really call, when it was snow on the ground, it was maybe out sledging and all thing, 
my mother would insist we put on were fulpies. Now, this was a thick jacket, which uh, I couldn't have been doing with, because you couldn't have play in it right, and fit made it worse. She would mark you put it on top of your already thick gansy you had on, so you was too hot and it just wasn't comfy at all. But I was tilted, the infant I was tilted, and I put on my fulpy, but little did you care, and from was out of the fulpy would come off and it would be lying in the ground somewhere. Um, because I just couldn't be dealing with it. So a fulpy is a thick, thick jacket, worn when it was really cold with her. And for the last time in this online Doric Call My Bluff, Gary. When my old man worked in the theatre in Aberdeen, he I used to speak about Jake the Ghost, who he had a few encounters with when he was working late, pinting scenery on his own. Jake could be mischievous. He would shift brushes and Dad's back was turned. But there was a couple of times Dad swore that Jake had helped him out. The first time was when he'd gone out his uncle and he herpled down the back stair to the door that would have led him out to the accident and emergency at the All Woman Hell. When he got to the bottom of the stair, the padlock that was usually eye-locked was somehow mysteriously hanging open. And the second time, when he got spray pint in his ain, he crawled blind across the stage, and instead of fan doon into the orchestra pit, he found himself at the thing in the props room at the back of the stage. Now that means that Jake could be described as a fulpy, which is a friendly ghost, a benign spirit, heen that's near there to give you a fear, but is there to watch over you and make sure you don't come to any harm. So there we have it. Three definitions of the word fulpy. Is it A, a puppy, B, a great muckle coat, or C, an half a friendly ghost? Would our panellists reveal the right answer? Susan has the right answer. A fulpy is a puppy. Well, well, Abdi, I hope you've uh, been off a fair tricket with a special online Doric called My Bluff as part of the Across the Grain Festival 2020. We are thanks to all the clever folk that work at Aberdeenshire Library headquarters for coming up with all the words and the definitions. And a special thanks to Jackie Caroon for making Athen come together. So it's cheery bye for our panellists. Susan. Cheerio. Gary. Goodbye. And Irene. Bye. And it's cheery bye for me too. Hope to see you all next year.